I, I almost felt like, I felt like it was a stress test. You know, like when they want to see how, like, uh, okay, we got a new brand of rubber band. Let's see how it does. Uh, you know, or a belt, you know, a, a, a belt for your car. Let's see how this radiator belt does. Oh. We're going to run it until it breaks. You're talking We're going to run it for <laughs> high RPMs and run it until Cam's it breaks. Cam's Achilles are the radiator belts in this yeah, analogy. Uh, that yeah, that was the stress test, and it, it passed whatever his usage was the other night. Dude, with flying colors, this whole training camp has been one big passing grade for uh, – not even passing grade. Like, I would say exceptional grade for Cam Akers, who you just heard right there, who in the game – and we're going to do a little stock up, stock down here. A lot yeah. of people texting in saying, what are your guys' thoughts on who's making this team? We're going to give them to you here over the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes. Um, but Cam Akers was the big stock up for me, Seth, in that game. And that was, the play we heard right there was a catch on fourth and three where I don't know that he caught it in position where he would have gotten three yards. But it was he, – he, he shook a tackler, which was really yeah. just – that was more impressive than the three spins. The spins were sizzly, but the the making the first guy miss, yeah, and kind of the angle his body was at when he caught it was really impressive. Vandy's call on that though, when he was going spin move, another spin move. I'm like, is he gonna get the third one? And another spin move. I'm like, yes, Vandy. That's why you're the goat. Good job. Um, here was Cam Akers after the game, talking about what he showed everybody this training camp. I feel good. You know what I mean? I feel good. I feel like I show people I'm still who I am. I, I haven't lost a step and uh. To see how, how it go. Dude, you, you nailed it earlier. If if you just brought somebody to the game and and watched said, watch this game, and then pick out the guy who's had two Achilles tears in the last four years. Three right. years, actually. I oh, know four years. It was training camp. No, three years. Training camp 2021. Three years. Two Achilles in the last three years. He would have been the last guy on the list. He would have been. I, I, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I tell you what, the guy I probably would have picked – if I had if somewhere along the way asked, hey, how old is this guy too, uh, would be Case Keenum. Because uh, <laughs> Case, yeah. Case was a bit a little off. It was a you rough know? one. Yeah, uh, yeah Case, uh, Case was a little bit off. I think that the, the guy whose stock might, might have been most up after that game was Davis Mills. Just because I think in that game you could see that, all right, Case knows where to go with the ball. Could have had Mechie on a mega bomb uh, that wasn't. Uh, you know, Xavier Hutchinson had a really good game. Partly not just because of his production, but because just about every catch he had to make was a little bit off. And uh, it was um, – but, uh, but I, 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 I still do think Case ends up being the third-string quarterback. I do too. Just because of knowledge and system experience, uh, yeah. you know, coaching ability for the other guys. But Cam Akers was everything I think that you would want to see to see if this guy has actually recovered. And it's impossible, even though it's a fair comparison – I just always wonder, man, there are exceptions to the rule. And him even coming back from an Achilles tendon tear and making it in a couple years in the NFL puts him as an extreme exception with running backs. There's very few running backs that come back and make it at all after Achilles tendon tears. I think of Frank Gore, who early in his career in college, and I, I think his second ACL. But anyway, he had two ACLs early in his career when he was young and then went on to be one of the most durable running backs of all time. That Maybe Cam Akers is one of these guys that just – you had a couple of, and that was back when Frank Gore tore his Achilles or his uh, ACLs. That was back when it wasn't such a slam dunk easy recovery. So maybe it, it, he could be that exception. Maybe he's built different, man. Maybe he's yeah. built different. I the, I boiled down the Cam Akers situation because I think, look, we're staring at the possibility that Damian Pierce makes this team, having not played good football for this team in over a year, and yeah. and uh, or for about a calendar year or so, and. Uh, and Cam Akers not making this team, having had one of the best training camps of any players offensively, if that were to happen, my big question would be, why did you bring Cam Akers in in the first place? Unless unless they trade Cam Akers for a fifth-round pick right. over Which, the next again, 24 hours. I thought it would have been a cool plan if you had told me about it in July <laughs> when they first signed him, and I was saying, hey, everybody, look, I know the name has it's got some flash to it, and you, know, you, you remember his highlights, but he hasn't been the same guy, et cetera, et cetera. I was very cautious about cam Akers, and i don't regret being cautious about it but man everything that gave me reason for skepticism has been disproven so I, this would if they if they retain damian pierce but trade away cam Akers, being like they looked at that last preseason game as some kind of showcase for him i'd be really upset about that yeah, I, yeah. if they keep damian pierce as a thought of, like, okay, look, we're waiting for it to click for him in this offense. 
I would still be skeptical of that, if, but, and maybe they're keeping him as the third running back. But if they did that and also traded away Cam Akers, uh, that, this would be the biggest issue I've had with this regime of D'Amico and Casario uh, being paired up. Yeah, I think so, too. If this, you're right. With these two guys here, I think there were some moves made early on with the team when yeah. they were trying to rebuild that you could, you could take or leave. But this would be one of this pairing of Nick and D'Amico that if Pierce is a Texan come Tuesday afternoon and Akers is somewhere else, I think this, yeah, this will be like the, like, I think you put it great earlier. Like, this will be our first fight of the D'Amico yeah. Ryans era. Like, the, yeah. it's been a year and a half long honeymoon. Longer than a lot of honeymoons, but this will be our first fight. It would be the first time D'Amico farted in front of us. Right. You know? And right, we're like, right. okay, do I still feel the same way about right. this person? But it's I like feel a, that I will. But it's I like rancid and nasty. You know what I mean? There's nothing <laughs> lovable about it. <laughs> like It's, it's, not, it's <laughs> not a cute little popcorn fart. Yeah, it's not fart. just like one where it's the noise, but there's no smell. Like, oh, okay, you do fart. It's <laughs> like, check oh, your God, underwear God, I got to yeah. uh, get out of the room. What is going on? <laughs> All right, so stock stock up good job Seth stock up uh Cam Akers for sure we'll see what happens we'll see what I I would expect we'll start seeing moves from the Texans after Joe's press conference today D'Amico's got a press conference at nine o'clock today according to the schedule the Texans sent out I would imagine we'll start seeing moves after that um maybe before if we haven't before and we haven't before eight o'clock we'll tell you what they are um stock up Neville Hewitt Here's a handoff to Scott starting right, and he's going to be brought down short of where he needed to go by Neville Hewitt. That's a lock. Bubble wrap him. He's going to make it as Hewitt can play linebacker, and he's a special team superhero. And he had, the, like, he had the bubble wrap out in full force on Saturday. I feel like Neville Hewitt would gnaw through the bubble wrap uh, and go out and find somebody to hit. He's Dude. like, Neville Hewitt definitely needs a cone around his neck. Uh, if he's, he needs one of those know, dog man. cones I feel like, to keep from. <laughs> I feel like Neville Hewitt would just flex his trapezius and the thing would just <laughs> pop off. Put him in bubble wrap and a neck cone. Yeah. I think uh, I, I really feel like if Neville Hewitt played in 1997, he'd be uh, a All pro bowl yeah. linebacker. He's, He's an old school linebacker. He is just hell on wheels against. Well, Dex Thomas was undersized and like kind of speed. I just mean like a tackle machine kind of thing. Okay. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, style. yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think he's on the squad, especially because special teams. I, the problem is there's a lot of guys now where there's more depth at positions than there's been in the past, and there's more guys like Gumbawale and Neville Hewitt where you just it, you can't just call all of these guys a lock because of special teams because they are also competing with other guys who might not be as good at special teams but might be better at their, at their position. So I hesitate to call any of the really good special teams players a lock, but I think that linebacker is thin enough right now that Neville yeah. Hewitt's definitely a lock. Yeah, I, that's the thing. Like, if Christian Harris is not playing in week one against Indianapolis, there's a really good chance that Neville Hewitt is out there on first and second down quite a bit, you know, just based on his ability against against the run. So I think I, I think I, I agree with Vandy's sentiment in that highlight. That's that's my point here is I think he had a he had a good game. It wasn't just that play. He was all over the place. There's a reason that Andre said guess who during that yeah. highlight is that Neville Hewitt had made a bunch of plays up to that point in the game. Plus, of, I hadn't watched uh, we were like I hadn't watched the TV copy of it. Did he get away with a little bit of a mini horse collar on that one or was it uh, on one of the plays he did. I don't know if it was that play in particular, yeah. but on one of the plays he did and I don't know who the running back was. It might have been Zach Evans because he was getting uh -huh. a lot of the carries for the Rams, whoever it was, who was literally, as, as he was falling to the ground, was pointing at his horse collar <laughs> to the referee. Like, the guy's falling. He's like, he got me. Got the horse collar, honestly, the horse collar is a way more nuanced rule than I, you would ever think it was. So yeah. uh, I always hesitate to call something definitely a horse collar or not. A few people weighing in here. Just going to mix, mix a few of these in before we get to a couple more stock up, stock down. We'll do acknowledge me in about 10 minutes or so. Um, text message, if they keep DP, it's going to make me angry. I obviously hadn't seen the day-to-day -day at practice, but it's like they've insisted on giving him chances, which is fine, but it feels like it's taken away opportunity from other guys. That's, boy, one of my biggest things on my podcast right after the game, Seth, where I do four winners, four losers. One of the losers wasn't Damian Pierce himself. It was the entirety of the situation with Damian Pierce, where I yeah. find myself now – Look, staring straight in the face the possibility that I'm going to get angry at two of the people who are my favorite people in this Texans organization, D'Amico Ryans and Damian Pierce, and probably maybe Nick Casario too. If, if, if Damian's still on this team, I just there's been no evidence that he's better 
it, than the options they have right now. It feels almost like a Lance McCullers situation where a lot of people that just are angry at Lance McCullers basically because he's uh, like he's a guy that's done great things for the organization, uh, but he just he can't stay healthy and people get angry at him over time. And likewise with Damian, it's not injury issues, but it's just his actual production. He goes from one of the guys that you love the most to where all of a sudden he becomes the object of, of all of your derision. And yeah, I don't want to feel that way about Damian. So the texter says that, you know, he hasn't seen the practices. You and I have seen almost all of the practices that have been here in Houston. I've, I've missed like two or three of them. Um, yeah, I've been impressed with him in practice, but that's what makes me nervous because the running back position, as I say over and over again, practice lies about running backs because breaking tackles is a very, very big and important part of especially Damian Pierce's game. And he's not tested with that in practice. So he looks great in practice, but Damian's superpower is breaking tackles. So even when the blocking is bad, it, like, can he break some tackles? He hasn't really shown any aptitude for that over the last you know, season plus this training camp. And I just, I don't want them to be deluded by good practice performances by Damian Pierce. It's yeah. just, it's not as simple as that. Yep. Uh, last stock up, John Mechie. Boyle gets the snap. He's got time, fires right side, hits Mechie. Winds to the outside, sheds a tackle wow. across the 50. Nice burst of speed, close to a first down. Well, I think he is rounding into shape and is becoming the player they thought they would have when he was drafted. Yeah, Met Mechie weathered the storm, at least the storm that was coming from the media. I don't know if the people in the building ever viewed Mechie as being on the bubble or not. I mean, look, mm -hmm. they don't view Damian Pierce, it looks like, as being on any sort of bubble right now. So who knows how they felt about John Mechie, who was just going through a period of a couple of weeks where he was dropping the ball and, and was having, tough time, having a tough time getting open. He's doing both of those things now. He's getting open. And that, that play right there... I can see why it got undersold a little bit. Like when you rewatch that play right there, the spin move that he made to the outside yeah. on that play, it is something where you watch a second time. You go, "Wow, that was really impressive." That didn't it, that, that didn't pop with me the first time, but that was a really impressive move to get away from felt, the guy. Honestly, Sean, it felt like he was a guard who was about to kick the ball out to uh, a corner three, and uh, then Euro stepped his way, like spun in Euro step, yeah. and then and then hit it hard towards the man. towards the hole. Yeah. It was really it was an impressive move. I think with Mechie, this is what I always try to remember, looking at it from Nick Casario's perspective, was in some regards you almost have to look at him like a rookie, even though this is his third year in the league. The first two years he was battling cancer, and really even after he cleared recovery, it was still a tax on his body last year. That I think that there's a really good chance that they all along were looking at, okay, but he's making progress, he's just not quite there yet, and that he, he might have been safe no matter what, even if he had made this turnaround. But I think with this turnaround, and, and really, just like Damian, okay, the biggest thing is he's not breaking tackles, and I think there's a lot that goes into that. But with Mechie, it's, he wasn't catching the football. You know, his, uh, he had so many drops. And even with a lot of the positives in practice, he still also had a lot of drops in practice. He's, he's rectified that in the last couple of weeks. I think I'll be really surprised if both Xavier Hutchinson and John Mechie don't make the team. I, I'm 100% I'm with you on that. There was another play. Like, there was another play where Mechie was – wide open and might still be running if Case Case almost threw an interception on the play. Like Case threw it right at a linebacker. But yeah. Mechie, if you go back and watch that play, Mechie is wide open running yeah. down a seam. So Mechie, yeah, Mechie's on this team. I'm with you. Hutchinson and Mechie, I think, are both on this team. I, I think the other guys, too, that I would put on there is not not on the team, but stock up from that game was uh, John, John Johnny Johnson and Steven Sims. I yes. think like, they both did things in that game where – you can really appreciate their upside. And uh, like at least one of those guys, if they don't make the team or on the practice squad, if they clear I think. Um, I, I thought that I thought I enjoyed watching that game because the two positions where I think the most battles are at wide receiver and running backs, you really saw those guys step up to they the plate. They showed up, I thought up, they all man. played their butts off. Yeah, yeah, great point, great point. Yeah, they all showed up. I have Sims making it on mine. In, yeah. In part because of the – 
a lo in large part. special teams, right? That's another game. one where you're like, man, we got a lot of guys. That's, it's good for special teams, but I don't know how many guys you can keep just because of special teams. But he's a guy who can win a game for you on special yeah. teams, you know, like if he's able well, and to I think he's, he's also a guy that adds a speed element when there's injuries, too, in yeah. your receiving core, you know. Like, he's a, he can open things up just by virtue of just being as fast as he is. Part of the reason they averaged six yards a carry is he had one carry for 38 yards in that game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you take that one out, it's more like 5.2 uh, yards per carry. Um, all right, let's do a couple stock down. Des King. Ethan Evans, the punter, unloads. Des King back deep for the Houston Texans and drops the ball. It's loose. The Rams fall on it. They've got it inside the 15-yard line. No sunshine to blame that on, and the Rams have the ball in the red zone. He was just running before he fielded the ball, and it's going to be a big turnover. That was a guy who is probably feeling the crunch of making a 53-man roster. Yeah. <laughs> trying to make a play. <laughs> I saw some people speculate that maybe the shaft of sunlight and the missing panel somehow did it. I went back and I did the geometry on it, Sean. No chance. I, I got out my protractor and everything. <laughs> the hypotenuse didn't match up with, uh, with, with uh, the, the apex yes. of the ball. He was looking at nothing but a backdrop of roof yep. when he was when that ball mm. down. So that was just a muffed that was a muffed punt. Pythagoras is so proud of you right now, man. The, the, you, you doing that A squared plus B squared. I'm more of a Euclides guy myself. Are you? Okay. I'm, a, well, I'm yeah, just telling you. Yeah. I talked to Pythagoras, and he's really <laughs> proud of you. Um, here's to be He gets all the credit, but it's uh, Euclides <laughs> that really does. did Pythagoras that. Pythagoras is a pub hound. Everybody knows oh. that. Euclides uh, exists, everybody. <laughs> he, uh, here's D'Amico Ryans on uh, Desmond King. Does it, how does this affect your evaluation of Desmond King? Nothing is said, like I said earlier, nothing is said on who punt return or who, like, we have a lot of decisions to be made. We'll see where we end up. Okay, well, there you go. So that's, uh, D'Amico's got his cards, and he's holding them right up against his vest. Uh, another stock down. This was one that had you and I and Clint and everybody else up in the press box looking at each other. Every time the referee would go, holding, number 34. We got four of those in the game on Saturday. Troy Hairston. Aspiring fullback, and this is the real shame with this, is that the fullback position is kind of there to be grabbed right now by the throat yeah, with Andrew Beck yeah. out. Like that's, and I know Harrison got into the end zone. I feel like there's any number of NFL players that could have caught that ball and turn it got into the end zone that wouldn't have held on four other plays in the game, and he missed on a few blocks as well. Like man, he just there was an opportunity there, and touchdown or no touchdown, he did not take advantage he's, of that opportunity. He's he's had some really glaring misses in the blocking game. The actual, even if he'd had zero holds on that game, I would have looked at his work as a blocker over the last couple of weeks and thought, like, no, you can't, you can't go in trusting him to be your fullback. Right. Um, he's whiffed a lot. So, uh, hey, look, it's been, he's been a little bit of an experiment because he was a college defensive player. And uh, it's, you know, he's, it's been learning. Over the last three years, he missed all of last season. But I, I just, it's not working out, not to the point where you can keep him on as an experiment. Right. I think – like British British Brooks in the limited sample size I've seen, like he hasn't had as many opportunities to miss blocks. But um, as a combo running back slash fullback, like I, I like the idea of British Brooks a lot more than T Troy Harris. Uh, no doubt, no doubt about it. Uh, text messages coming in. If DP makes the squad, do y'all think less of D'Amico and Nick? No, <laughs> no, no. I don't. Just, yeah, I don't think less of them at all. I think that I think that every coach and every GM, they sometimes have blind spots for players. It happens all the time, no matter how great they are. And in my opinion, that's what this would be. Now, we talked about Kyle Tucker earlier. Look, a lot of, a lot of people were frustrated with the Astros organization when they, uh, you know, deemed Kyle Tucker untouchable because it, it wasn't looking like Kyle Tucker should be an untouchable guy as a young player. That worked out for the Astros. Um, I don't, yeah. but I, it's just football's got a different timeline, you know? Yes, Absolutely. It's got a different timeline and it's got fewer games. You just you don't have time to let some of these experiments play out.